Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I am Rebecca Quinn with the North Dakota Brain Injury Network and welcome to our webinar Wednesdays. Um, we have webinar Wednesdays every we other Wednesday at 1.30. So we have this one today and then I know we have two more at least scheduled through the month of August coming up. So be sure to check out for those. Um, and they are archived on our website. So we do record them and they are archived and you can go back and watch them or go and uh, apply, fill out a survey to get your CEUs for them and um, those pieces. So that's all available on our website if you want for more information. Uh, today's topic for Webinar Wednesdays, we are covering brain injury in the criminal justice system. Um, this was actually originally a ten, it intended to be a panel at our Mind Matters Conference. And then when the Mind Matters Conference got canceled because of COVID, we still wanted to have an opportunity um, to discuss this topic and to, to have our panel members share. So we figured this would be a really good format to do this and we'll see how it goes. Um, this will be kind of our first time doing sort of a panel type thing with Zoom, so we'll see. Uh, but hopefully it'll go well. Um, we are going to start out, I'm going to go through kind of just a quick presentation that covers some information regarding uh, brain injury and criminal justice. And then we'll have our two panel members um, introduce themselves and share uh, their information and have some questions that we'll go through for them to share their experiences with uh, brain injury and criminal justice. So we'll go from there, okay? So I am going to share my screen. So um, starting out, as I said, brain injury and the criminal justice system. Um, numerous, numerous studies across the entire world um, have shown that while roughly about 10% of the population um, has experienced a head injury, um, studies typically put it uh, within the criminal justice population, about 50 to 80 percent um, in various different offender populations. So this has um, been highly, highly studied um, and just kind of consistently the studies put uh, the history of brain injury much higher amongst the offender population. Um, so as I said, numerous, numerous studies across the world. Here is um, some of those. Um, it is, uh, this was ones that were done. Um, so Ohio did one um, and it was 78%. Uh, um, New South Wales had one that was 83%. Uh, Minnesota was 83% as well. Um, Texas was 88% of their offender population. Um, Tacoma, Washington did one within the Tacoma jails and it was 87%. Um, this one, I did not put the label on there, but that is New Zealand. Um, and even in New Zealand, it was 86%. Um, so this is amongst all the various prison studies. Uh, so these were all done with male prisoners. Um, and it's just was basically on an interview with just reported history of general head injury. So any head injury. Um, now these three studies actually looked at the rate of loss of consciousness, you know, not just a head injury, but loss of consciousness within that. Um, so Ohio had loss of consciousness at 58%, um, New South Wales at 43%, um, Minnesota also 43%, um, and Texas 36%. Uh, Minnesota uh, did a study. Um, this was amongst their prisoners, those that made it to incarceration. Um, they did look at 998 inmates. Um, of those, out of the males, um, it was 83% reported having had one or more head injuries. Uh, their females was 90% and the juveniles was at 99% within the, the Minnesota study. Um, and then these were the causes. This is the causes from that Minnesota study. So the primary cause at 37% was assault, uh, which is much, much different than uh, the CDC within the general population. Uh, the CDC data 
puts a salt at less than 10%. So much higher than um, within the general population. Um, auto uh, motor vehicle crashes was the next at 25%, um, and then falls in sports were tied at 11, um, bicycle at 10%, and then a 6% other. Um, and then there was a Colorado study uh, done most recently. Um, this was a study that actually led to an article in Newsweek magazine. Um, so they did a total of, and that was actually 4,000 um, and uh, six, 164. So there's a number missing there. <laughs> um, total screens. Uh, so they did over 4,000 screens. Um, this was throughout their jails and their prisoners and their juvenile uh, facilities. So they kind of went throughout all of their facilities in Colorado. Um, a total percentage of adults with positive screens was 54%. Um, a total percentage of juveniles with positive screens was 18%. Um, and then one of the things that was different about the Colorado study was they then did a follow-up if somebody screened positive, had them do a follow-up and had a neuropsychological testing uh, to see if they had impairment. And so out of those that screened positive, 73% of them had a current neuropsychological impairment. So they were able to say not only do they have, you know, a high percentage of individuals with brain injury within the, you know, Colorado criminal justice population, but amongst those, they had a significantly high percentage of them having neuropsychological impairments that are affecting them. So um, that, that's from the Colorado study. This, they just did this study last year. Um, but then one of the things that they also did with Colorado was they kind of dug a little bit deeper and looked at the co-occurring amongst those that screen positive, show what they called their, their TBI cohort. Uh, and then they found amongst that higher percentage of childhood violence. So 60% of those had experienced childhood violence compared to roughly studies put at 10% of the general population. 62% um, had experienced adult victimization. 39% um, had at least one um, suicide attempt. Uh, school suspension and a history of school suspension, 54% um, of the cohort. Um, substance abuse or misuse, they found that 93% of their cohort had a history of abuse or misuse. Um, and then mental health. They found that 75% had at least one mental health diagnosis compared, comparatively. So they found that not only had they identified these individuals with brain injury within the population, but then found that those had, you know, significantly higher co-occurring conditions that were making it more complicated to even address the brain injury within that. So women, um, the Minnesota study had um, identified women um, as well. There were a couple other studies that did look at women. Um, there was a London study uh, that identified that 65% of their female prisoners had a history of brain injury and a New Zealand study that put it at 94%. Um, one of the things that one of the studies looked at was that women involved in the criminal justice system convicted of a violent crime are more likely to have sustained a pre-crime TBI or some other form of physical abuse versus those that have been convicted of a non-violent crime. Uh, juvenile justice. So a uh, New York City jail study did find that uh, adolescents, 67% uh, of screen detainees reported a history of brain injury um, amongst them. Again, assaults were a high percentage at 55%. Um, and then Pennsylvania screened juveniles and found that half of the juveniles screened at two of their detention centers uh, screened positive for brain injury. Um, and then of those that they went on to receive neurocognitive testing, 56% did show an impairment. So one of the things that they've also looked at um, is young injuries. 
So, so injuries that happen when an individual is younger. Uh, so across all of the studies, a majority of the injuries have occurred prior to first criminal activity. Um, I do know that when I've talked with individuals in the past just about the high rate of brain injury within criminal justice, a lot of times people assume and they'll say, well, yeah, that makes sense because, you know, of fights while somebody's incarcerated or, you know, assaults while, you know, work, you know, involvement with, you know, law enforcement and things. But, but it's the, the key here is no, actually the brain injury is, is usually occurring before any involvement with criminal activity and really is more from your causes related to like childhood assault, uh, you know, sports injuries, car crashes, those things. So uh, that, that has been something that I've you know, explained to people and saying, no, we're not talking about injuries that happen after involvement with criminal justice, but majority of them are pre. Um, so there was a study uh, by McKinley um, that looked at the relationship uh, between brain injury and childhood and adult behavior. Um, they found, you know, like others, that individuals experience um, childhood brain injury were more likely to have an offending history and then found that there was a relationship between uh, the brain, the severity of the brain injury to the, the stronger the offense. So if an individual had more severity um, you know, of an injury, then they would be having a higher you know, crime level or higher likelihood of being involved in criminal activity. So they did find that connection between those two. Um, so impacts on correctional services. Uh, this is a lot of this information did come out of the study done by Minnesota. Um, they did find that um, individuals that have a history of brain injury have higher levels of alcohol and drug use preceding their incarceration compared to their non-brain injury um, incarcerated peers. Uh, they have more prior uh, incarcerations. Um, one thing that, and this is particularly this piece from Minnesota, uh, they found that individuals with brain injury while incarcerated were, had an increased utilization of services. So they did find that they were more expensive prisoners. Um, they had an increased utilization of both health and psychological services while they were incarcerated. Um, had a lower ability to maintain rule abiding behavior during incarceration. Um, so lower ability to kind of follow the rules um, while they were incarcerated. Um, lower treatment completion rates, particularly for those that were doing any type of like deferred, um, you know, sentencing treatment or treatment while they were incarcerated and a higher rate of disciplinary incidents and then a higher rate of recidivism. So amongst the TBI group, there was 17% higher than a low risk, low TBI group. So which kind of speaks to earlier that saying of, um, you know, had more prior convictions. So that higher rate of recidivism um, was found. And so one of the things with this is that they said Minnesota study really looked at some of this and then both Minnesota and Colorado have been saying, okay, now what? What do we do about that information? So part of that is the question of why. So why is this happening? Um, part of it is really the symptomology related to the injury and how that is impacting an individual's involvement with criminal justice and their involvement in their life. Um, and then undiagnosed lack of treatment. Um, so the symptomology um, related to brain injury um, and, you know, a lot of the symptomology that is well known about brain injury within those that have had training. So hopefully you guys have had training, but not necessarily well known within the general population uh, related to impaired cognition, impaired executive functioning, uh, behavioral management, you know, impulse control, those behaviors and how those impact involvement with, you know, other individuals, the community, but then also law enforcement, at, you know, as things go. Um, particularly emotional dysregulation, impulsivity, 
and impaired processing speed have really been shown to have an impact on criminal justice involvement. Um, impaired processing speed is one that we don't necessarily think about and how that has that role. But if somebody has impaired processing speed and they're asked something by, let's say, law enforcement, and it takes them time to respond because they're trying to process what was said to them. And so they maybe are slower and they kind of do this, um, uh, okay. Uh, or maybe they don't even like, they're still doing what they were asked not to do. Then that might be seen by law enforcement as a, you know, non-compliance and refusal to, you know, respond. And so then it gets escalated, whereas really it was related to that pair processing speed of understanding what was asked of them. Um, and so they really found that that it makes a big difference, particularly in, you know, training that's provided to law enforcement and even those, you know, criminal justice professionals as far as how to slow things down and make sure that the person's understanding what's being asked before assuming that they're being non-compliant. So that being related to that, the symptomology that goes along with brain injury and how those impact, um, you know, and then that leading to that further involvement. Um, you know, <clears throat> and then the next piece is undiagnosed brain injuries. Um, majority of the brain injuries involved in the criminal justice system are, have been undiagnosed. They were not ones that the person was walking around saying, oh yeah, I've had a brain injury. Um, brain injury is often referred to as the hidden disability. Um, it is not uncommon for somebody to not have an understanding that they have a brain injury. Um, that it's possible that they have had this injury and it's having significant impacts on them, but nobody's ever really explained it as a brain injury to them or helped them understand what it means, those pieces. Um, as I said, you know, Minnesota did their study um, and found that significant percentage of individuals within Minnesota uh, Department of Corrections had a history of brain injury. Minnesota's actually had a phenomenal brain injury registry for like 30 plus years. And when they actually did their prison study, they only found one individual within the prison study that was also captured in their Minnesota um, brain injury registry. So, but it's because the majority of them were those that didn't seek treatment or were not seeking treatment at a place that maybe uh, had to report to the registry. So particularly that high percentage of assaults. So, you know, often individuals maybe don't seek treatment because they don't have insurance. Um, they may have been, you know, intoxicated or under the influence at the time. They may just see it as not something they need to be seeking treatment for. Uh, it might be, you know, something they don't see it as that big of a deal. So, so those type of things really lead to that kind of undiagnosed. Um, and then one of the things is when you have that undiagnosed hidden disability, particularly in like youth and children, is you then have a higher percentage of dropping out of school, um, start abusing substances, uh, failed relationships, kind of this cycle of failure. So maybe ending up in the mental health system, becoming homeless, um, unable to maintain a job. So sort of this cycle of failure without really having a way of pinpointing why. Um, and so a lot of those things then kind of funnel into activities that might lead to somebody being involved in the criminal justice system. So, and then a big piece is um, for undiagnosed brain injuries is systems that their primary function is not brain injury, um, often do not document brain injury. So even if somebody, you know, has a loss of consciousness when they're involved and they were to seek treatment from a system that doesn't deal with brain injury, um, it's not really going to be documented. Um, you know, if somebody were to seek mental health care or education care or care within criminal justice or substance use, that's not a traditional brain injury um, provider. So they usually do not document it unless there's significant medical documentation to go with it. Um, 
and or unless there's brain injury screening in place. Um, and very few places are doing brain injury screening kind of routinely. Um, so obviously, um, as a result, many brain injuries are undiagnosed um, and there is a need for screening to exist. Um, we do have an entire webinar in screening. So if you want more questions on that, you're welcome to watch that. Um, but definitely screening is, is a big piece um, of how to kind of do the next step. Um, so then a question is, <coughs> so what is the North Dakota Brain Injury Network doing? And what are we doing? Um, one, I say that we have partnered with amazing early adopters in the state. So Jill Crone, who's gonna be speaking today, uh, who's a behavioral health parole officer out of Fargo. Um, and then NIAM Brain Injury Services out of Fargo, which is a new brain injury uh, provider in Fargo um, that really is specializing um, in individuals that have uh, co-occurring or multi-occurring um, conditions along with brain injury. Um, and that is where our other uh, speaker, uh, Mark, is at today um, from their offices. Uh, and then also Tiva Lange, who is a uh, addictions counselor at James River Correctional Center. And she has also um, had us come and do a training there at James River uh, for uh, the inmates on actually brain injury screening. I uh, kind of gave them an overview of brain injury and um, the impact of brain injury and symptomology and then how to screen, um, particularly that was for the inmates at James River Correctional that are doing um, peer support. Um, I will say that when we did that training there, um, I had inmates that asked me questions i would never been asked before in my 10 plus years of brain injury training. Um, some of them were incredibly insightful. Uh, they had really, you know, thought out questions and really were concerned about how is this an issue and how can they help the peers that they're working with. Um, and I had more than one of the inmates come to me and say, okay, but how do we get James River to now be doing universal screening? Like, how do I get where I can, you know, make sure to know about this? And that, so, so it really started that question. Um, so that, that's been great. So we were able to go to do that training and Tiva Lange is there and she's continuing to do screening with the individuals. She works there and providing that information at James River, which has been really great. Um, and so that's kind of, and then we also did do, thank you to Jill again, um, did training at uh, Cass County uh, Corrections. And so we're able to do training for them. Um, and then both Jill and Tiva have taken our certified brain injury specialist training, which is a high, even higher level of training to become certified brain injury specialist. Uh, so, you know, providing that training out there and working on that piece has been a, a big piece that we've been focused on. Um, and then the next step that's kind of on our horizon that we're working on is development of a framework from Colorado. So Colorado is part of their, you know, they had done all that screening piece. They then developed a, a framework of support. Um, and so we're going to be working on adopting that for North Dakota. Um, their framework has an online screening and symptom inventory. So it's set up for any provider to be able to do screenings and then have an individual complete a quick symptom inventory. And then they would enter that information online to us. And then we would provide follow up to that provider regarding how the individual screened, uh, what symptoms they're you know, dealing with, and then uh, tip sheets for the individual and the provider on working with them regarding those symptoms. So um, one of the things that uh, Colorado found is part of this framework for support is not treating the brain injury as separate, um, so, but treating the brain injury and providing support and resources for the individual where they're at. Um, so that was one of the things that they really found important pieces. Um, this was true as well with the Minnesota study when they really found like, how do we work on that recidivism? You know, it's enough to be like, okay, we're going to screen and we know we have this really high rate of brain injury amongst our, you know, incarcerated, but okay, then what? And so both the Minnesota and Colorado really found 
having to provide education and support where that individual is at and really work on that, that increase in that individual's ability. Um, so they found that it really dis demystifies brain injury for non-brain injury professionals. Um, that's been a big key for me um, because one of the things that I found in the, you know, 10 years I've been working in brain injury in North Dakota is that everybody at, you know, at the beginning, professionals really saw it as like brain injury is not my problem. And if I identify an individual as brain injury, then that automatically means that they should go to this off separate brain injury specialized system. And one of the things that I've really worked on is we don't have enough of a population to have some wondrous separate brain injury system. Um, instead, individuals with brain injury are just across all of our various systems and our systems need to be able to manage and handle and support those individuals brain injury within them. And a big key for that is demystifying brain injury for professionals and say, hey, this is no different than anything else. This is no different than dealing with somebody with addiction, no different than dealing with somebody, you know, with a sleep disorder, whatever. You just have to kind of have an understanding and be able to manage it. Um, but then the second piece um, is really empowering individuals with brain injury and families to advocate for appropriate supports. Um, what, you know, that empowering individuals with brain injury. And that's one of the things that, you know, we wanted to have Mark here today to share and be able to share the information about what coming to that understanding of brain injury meant to him. And, but, but being able to have those individuals with brain injury that are maybe in that undiagnosed category and have never had an understanding before how it's impacting them to come to understand that and then be able to advocate for what they need moving forward. Um, so Colorado has developed a training curriculum um, that is used within their uh, Department of Corrections now that is a curriculum that kind of works on, hey, so you've had a brain injury. This is what it means. Um, and so, but a big piece of it being that empowered piece. So that is the end of my portion of talking. Um, I went through that really quickly. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about that specifically, or, but I also want to make sure to give Mark and Jill time that we're going to introduce them and allow them some time to speak and some questions. Okay. So we will go ahead and allow them. So I am really horrible at introductions. So I'm just going to kind of turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Um, but we have Jill Crone from, um, is it Cass County? Yeah, I'm in Cass County, but I actually work for the state of North Dakota. Okay, so for the state of advice and see I'm horrible at introductions. And then, <laughs> and so Jill, why don't you go ahead and start out there? I'm Jill Crony and work for the North Dakota Department of Corrections. I'm a parole officer and just recently in the last couple of years um, switched over to specialize with uh, the mental health caseload. Um, I do have a, another counterpart that she takes it in, um, has the same kind of caseload I do in <clears throat> Bismarck area on the west side of the state, but our department felt that there was a need for someone to specialize dealing with um, the mentally ill and just developing something that we could work with and not get, have them lost in our system because <clears throat> there's a huge need for mental health stuff, but um, and treatment and it's a different kind of uh, beast for us to deal with in, in as far as for the criminal justice part of this. Um, you know, parole and probation supervises thousands of people in the state, but you know, if you're on a regular caseload, unfortunately, just because of our numbers, you are kind of a number <clears throat> in our system because some of our um, POs are supervising upwards to 100 people, which it's pretty hard to give them special attention or um, have the time that is required for some of the people that have mental health issues or brain injury, things like that, you know, seeing someone once a month or every other month isn't quite <clears throat> the way that anyone's gonna, you know, really benefit from this. So we wanted to take it and look at it in a different light and spend more time and 
like Rebecca said in her presentation, right, meet them where they're at. So my caseload smaller. Um, I get to, I don't have like any extra funding or anything like that. Um, I don't have like a court or anything. It's just me. And it's kind of geared however I want it to be. So um, I try to make it that I at least make contact with them and see them at least a couple times a month. Um, I, I meet them at treatment groups or treatment um, at their homes, outside clinics, whatever works for them. Um, because like, like I said, I have a better success if I can meet them where they're comfortable versus just saying like you have to be in our, my office, you have to get here because transportation is an issue and the location of my office is not ideal for the, all the people you know that we serve. So. You know, it's easy to say, oh, take a bus here, right? But if you have a brain injury or if you have mental health issues, that's a huge, huge task to ask someone to do. So we've, so we've really changed that. So um, I've also taken the CIT training, um, done the CBIS training, just to try and educate myself and learn more about <clears throat> what would be beneficial for the population that I'm serving. So. Um, I have worked in with, I've worked a long time in corrections. I worked in a juvenile detention center uh, when I was younger, worked in the state of Minnesota's prison system at Stillwater, and then I worked for years in Clay County at the jail. So I've worked at kind of every level of corrections, right, involvement. So now I'm here. So that's a little bit about me. <clears throat> Which really surprised me when she said that she had worked in corrections for that long because she doesn't look old enough to have worked in corrections. <coughs> no. I got I got a question. I got a question. I misunderstood. Where did you say you were at? Your office? My office is in Fargo. We're right across the street from the Cass County Jail. Okay. How do you get? You said you work <laughs> other than other than Fargo. Like, uh, do you have? You're a probation department, right? Right. And do you, the people over here, well, the probation department here in Williston have connection. They, how am I asking this? Rebecca, help me. <laughs> so at this time, I believe for the, the specialized behavioral health uh, probation, parole and probation is only in Cass County and Berlay County. Right. Oh. Right. Um, we, we have people that we try to um, have them see in certain places, like you're saying you're in Williston? Yes. So we have POs that we try to take, uh, um, that we'll try and assign that have either volunteered to have some interest working with uh, mental health or something like that. And so we try to have them take those cases because we found that <clears throat> If we have one person assigned to some of these, you know, some of these cases, we have better luck because we're constantly in contact with the different services departments, like the human service centers, the treatment, things like that. And so the things don't get lost in the shuffle, you know. So we have different people in different parts of the state that we kind of uh, assign them those cases. Oh, so what I'm understanding then is the, the people, the probation officers here, like uh, Kristen Lloyd and, and, and them aren't knowledgeable with what you're doing or? They're, they're knowledgeable. It's just that my caseload specializes. It, that's what I take instead of having a realm of everybody. Like, you know, like I take the severely mentally ill or dual diagnosed. Whereas <clears throat> like Lloyd or Kristen, like, are you talking Kristen Plessis? Right. Okay, so Kristen Plessis, her specialization is sex offenders. So, you know, so she takes only certain clients that fall within this category. Lloyd takes a little bit of everything, you know? And so like what we found was we used to have Fargo office, we have 15 parole officers and we'd all maybe have, you know, one or two or three cases or even more now that have severe mental illness, but we are all trying to figure out who they're connecting with. and kind of the turnover rate. And so we found that if we would put them all with one PO that had that caseload and always worked with the, the human services or the tr treatment agencies, that we'd have a better outcome because we could okay, build those relationships. Mental illness, is that a, 
And I, and I think that, you know, it's the benefit of having Jill that has that specialty of being able to have that, the, the time and that kind of understanding and awareness but that being part of like what we're trying to do with education and that individual self-advocacy piece of being able to get it to where those other individuals and those can, um, can have a better understanding. And as they gain that understanding, be able to work better with other individuals. To, uh, with the brain injuries, because there's some here who are on probation and parole that have head injuries. Yeah. And, and uh, it seemed like Lloyd would be, since Lloyd is the, what do you call the super of the boss or whatever, he would have knowledge, of, his staff would have a knowledge. I, I'm surprised Krista's just with the sexual offenders. She also works with brain injury, have some, what do you call, parolees or probationers that have severe head injury, that has had. <laughs> How do you say, maybe he's had, he's had three of them. Yeah, so and statistically pretty much all, I mean, based on the numbers that we showed, pretty much every, you know, parole and probation officer in the country has individuals with brain injury they're working with. Um, so we're just kind of lucky that Jill, that's, and I think that, I wouldn't say we're lucky that we have Jill, but also those positions were identified as it was identified as a need because the state did see that they had these individuals that were kind of cycling through and how do we work on that? So yeah. I think that as, you know, and now we've expanded more things like free through recovery and some different programs that are really starting to address those pieces. Um, yeah, go ahead. I want to make sure that we uh, introduce Mark. So Mark, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and share a little bit. Sure. Uh, my name is Mark Peckinkoff. Um, I guess uh, like my first brain injury came when I was five years old. Um, I got hit in the head with a brick. Kind of been just been having them every couple of events. I think I think I have about eighteen of them. Um, I guess kind of growing up or whatever. I managed to stay out of legal trouble, but I was always in some kind of trouble. And uh, I moved up to Fargo in 2001 from Wisconsin. And by 2003, I was in prison. And basically I was in prison the entire time until 2016. Um, got up, was on federal probation and Still kept getting in, getting in trouble, got revoked, went went back to prison twice, and then they, they were going to take me off of uh, they wanted to take me off federal probation because uh, I started started going to uh, treatment and trauma therapy and things like that, and I actually asked them not to take me off probation because it kind of gave me some accountability, um, but they said that basically I would just be a revolving door in another prison. So they released me from uh, probation, and I don't know. I think it was like maybe maybe three months after that, I got in trouble again. Um, so I ended up going to uh, Southeast, where where I met um, like Tony McCarty and Rebecca Quinn, and and uh, got put on probation and. I walked in the probation office and who did I see? Jill. And, and so uh, was it your first time meeting Jill? No, I've known Jill for about 20 years. <laughs> I, I thought that was really interesting when I heard that about you guys, that you guys do have this 20 year history. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen her for a while, but yep. I was a, not, I was not pleasantly surprised. As a matter of fact, I was like, oh man, I'm in a lot of trouble now. Um, <laughs> And at, when I was first on probation, we bumped heads pretty bad, actually. I would refer to her as Satan or <laughs> like literally that's what I call her. He did. Yeah. And uh, um, it was Satan's mistress. Sorry. I have to. <laughs> so um, I know like on, on my part, there was a lot of frustration because I kept getting in 
trouble, not huge trouble, but trouble, enough trouble to make, I don't know, life difficult. And like, I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure out like why, why this kept happening. Like it was, it was very disheartening actually. Um, and then I, to, uh, one of the groups at Southeast met Tony and she asked me a couple of questions and she says, you know, you got a brain injury. And I'm like, nah, I don't think so, but you know, whatever, you know, I was just kind of going with the flow and I'm not really one to argue or whatever. And, uh, so as we, as we started talking or whatever, um, I started to learn about it a little bit more and the effects that it has. And like a stigma that I always had was a person that has brain injury, um, becomes like slow. Like they, they, they can't think or the intelligence level drops or what have you. And I mean, I'm a relatively smart individual. I just can't process fast enough. <laughs> um, and I learned that people with brain injuries, their, their intellect doesn't, doesn't go away. Um, they're just as, they're just as, uh, you know, smart or whatever. They just have a hard time processing it because I guess you're, uh, like your IQ or whatever is developed by, I don't know, four or five years old or something, something like that. It was, it was like actually really young. And, uh, so that was when I started to like see some validity in what they were saying. And at the same time, I guess Jill was, she started learning about it and, um, kind of became like an, an understanding that I wasn't being rebellious and I wasn't being, um, you know, obstinate. It was just more of, I was just having a hard time. Um, and I remember the moment that I realized where, like where she was coming from was like, I was, I was on the ankle monitor and I was late and I was trying to figure out the bus system and always missing that. I just could for whatever reason, I could not be where I was supposed to be on time ever. And I come rushing into the office and basically push Jill out of the way and freaking out because I got to plug in my ankle monitor and I have my meeting. And when I'm all done, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, man, I was Jill. I'd think that I that I don't care either. I mean, it was that's kind of like the impression that I was giving was I just don't care. And then I get stuck in the corner and now I have to deal with the consequences. And that's not what it was. I was just very flustered because um, but like I said, I have a, I have a hard time putting things in, in order unless I have it written down very specifically. And I have more notebooks than I know what to do with. Um, so to me, it, that was kind of like a real, like life changing moment where I had to actually say, I can't, I can't take care of myself on my own anymore. You know, look, look at what happened 12 years in prison. It sucks. Um, and you know, I take responsibility for a lot of well, I mean, everything that I've done. Um, but I, I think that if I would have known this a lot earlier, I probably would have avoided 12 years of prison. You know, I, I'm sure I probably would have gotten into some kind of trouble or whatever. But I think I would have been able to understand why I make some of the choices or decisions that I make and, you know, how I react, especially to law enforcement. I used to be really aggressive, you know, towards law enforcement. Um, us and Adam and, and everything. And, you know, I, I don't get thrown in the back of a cop car every time a, a cop sees me now, you know, before it was, Oh, there's Mark. We gotta, we gotta get him off, the, get him off the street before he starts freaking out. And now they're, they're you know, I talked to one a couple of days ago, or like a week ago or whatever. And they, they told me that they heard I was doing, doing well, which was, uh, it was a shock actually. Um, you know, so I know that that's kind of what I've been going through, and you know, I, I if I can help somebody or, or you know, help help somebody be able to understand how a person like me, you know, tries to exist, you know, why wouldn't I want to do that? You know, to have somebody avoid what I've had to go through. So that's about it. Thanks. Um, Jill, do you want to share your it's sort of the evolution of understanding brain injury and how you kind of that on your side of it coming to terms with that along with Mark. So, you know, like Mark said, it's not, it's not that he's a, a dumb person. He's a very intelligent person. I mean, if you 
talk to him, you know, you would never think like, oh, he has a brain injury. But <clears throat> like Mark said, that incident that he described is that is the perfect one is that he was just so flustered. And I realized then too, that, you know, he was just as flustered. And, and I saw it that it, he wasn't trying to, you know, be rude or <clears throat> obstinate about the meeting or, you know, he wasn't not trying to ma not make it a priority. Whereas I felt like he was just trying to like miss out or he didn't take it seriously, you know, things like that. But then I think that was the aha moment. Like we realized, both realized like <clears throat> he, there's really a struggle there. Like he, he really does have a hard time putting things in order of importance, you know, instead of just making those impulsive decisions. So after that, we really worked on, you know, instead of having a, you know, like before, if I would, if I'm meeting with someone, you know, I'd say, you know, you'd, you'd maybe give them an assignment or some kind of homework, right? Something for them to do and accomplish by the next time we saw them. And it might be a number of things, but we would think that it's, you know, just as easy as like going to get a bus pass, right? Like you and I might think, oh, that's a really easy task. You know, you're going to get a bus pass, you get the money, you go down the bus station, you buy the bus pass, you do all that stuff, right? But I mean, a task like that for Mark can be a, a huge, huge issue because he has to try and put those steps together, right? He knows what he needs to do, but he doesn't always necessarily know what steps he has to take. So instead of trying to give an assignment, it's we tried to break it down piece by piece. Like, so what do you want? Like, if you want to get a bus pass, like, what would we need to do? Like, tell me the steps I would need to do. How much money would I need to do? Like, really break it down and simplify things because like I said, it's not that he's not smart. <clears throat> it's just that a task like that, that's simple for you and I or someone else, it really isn't that simple to him. And I realized that that's a true thing. Like he wasn't trying to be obstinate or anything like that. He just really didn't know how to put all the pieces together. Like he has this puzzle, but it's, it's not all going together and he's not sure how it fits. So we've really taught each other basically different ways to learn things, right? Slow things down, <clears throat> you know, do it step by step, repeat those things. Like if I give him an assignment, I want him to repeat it back to me so that I know what he's, how he's processing it, right? So explain, cause I'll, I'll say, you know, like if I said, go get the bus pass and I'll say, explain to me what I just asked you to do. What am I asking you to do so that there's no confusion, right? Like I'm, I'm not confused, confusing him on what I'm asking him to do. And he's not confused by what I'm asking because I found that if I leave any window for a gray, gray with Mark, he takes that little piece and runs with the wrong thing versus hearing all the good pieces, right? Because now that's the one thing that's confused him. So wouldn't you say Mark? Yeah. Like yeah, it's if, like, it's almost like, um, like a simple person is able to filter out, you know, okay, this doesn't make sense, or this is, if I do, it's like they can filter out, um, like a spam in, in your email or whatever. It, it doesn't, it doesn't show up because it has a filter. Whereas mine, I have my emails plus all the spam and I'm like, I don't know what it is. And if I grab onto the wrong, the wrong thing, now I'm going down that rabbit hole and I don't even pay attention to what I'm supposed to be. And the, the more I, the more I go down that, the farther I get away from whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing and I'm stuck. And most of the time it takes somebody to be able to pull me out of it because I, I just, I don't know how to do it on my own yet. So it's and really easy. And he's really worked hard on that, like really worked hard on it. And he recognizes it now, which is huge because now he's telling that it's so good that he recognizes it because before it would just spiral out of control and then you'd just be mad and pissed and then that would be the end of it. I was thinking, Mark, of, um, and you kind of had the, the, du the double piece, the double layers of you had an extended period of incarceration that, yeah. you know, has all of the things that go along with that, plus the significant brain injuries. I, you know, you relayed the story of going to, to Subway when you first got out of prison. Yeah. 
And would you would you like to quickly kind of explain that story? Yeah, when I when I got out of prison, I don't know, it was like almost almost eleven years straight that I did, and uh, they give me a. I was down in Miami, Florida, so I'm coming coming home, and they give me a, a Greyhound bus ticket. I have no idea how to get on the bus. I was like just nervous. They dropped me at the bus station. There was a subway, so I went to go order. I wanted to have a subway sandwich. I'm hungry or whatever. And when I walked up to the counter and I saw all the the choices of like meat and cheese and whatever else they got at Subway, I just, I completely lost it and just started screaming at this dude. <laughs> you know, and he's like, well, what, what kind of bread do you want? I'm screaming at him like, I don't know. Like, I have no idea what kind of bread I want. And it was so like um, debilitating that it just kept getting worse. And I would get more like not aggressive, but you could tell that I was freaking out and I started crying and the guy's like, what happened? I'm like, man, I just got out of prison and I don't know what to do. I have no idea what to do. So he was like, oh, he's like, well, how, you know, how long were you in prison? I told him almost 11 years. So, so he had to, I mean, I was lucky that the guy that was there was there, but he broke it down to what kind of bread do you want? Do you like white bread or do you like this kind of bread? What kind of cheese? What kind, you know, so forth and so on to where I was able to actually order a sandwich. And uh, at the end, he's like, so would you like cookies with that? And I was just about ready to start screaming at him. He's like, you know what? I'll just give you one of each. So don't, don't worry about it. So that, it's that, that frustration when it's almost like a fear that comes over me when I don't know how to make a decision that it's like, I just, I, I lose it. It's, I'm not like by nature, I'm not an aggressive person, but when that, when that feeling comes, it's, it's like, I don't have any control over it. Whatever happens, happens. A lot of times I don't even re really remember it. So, you know, I know that that's going to get me in trouble if I don't work on it. And so that's the type of stuff that you're kind of working on is that decision making and that not going down rabbit holes. Are there any other symptoms that you really kind of now are able to recognize and start to work on? Yeah. Um, like the thing I've been kind of dealing with lately is, is like relationships. Um, I have a hard time deciphering the, dif the difference between like a healthy, positive relationship and an unhealthy one. Um, mentally, I, I know what the difference is. I know what a health relationship and what isn't. It's when I'm, when I'm within the, the dynamics of one, I get very like overwhelmed or confused or I'm not, I'm not, I don't even really know at this point, but, um, like when I talk, when I talk to Jill about it, it makes complete sense what she's saying. You know, I'm in an unhealthy relationship and, you know, uh, I'm really working on trying to, you know, keep what's mine and, and not, I would say people take everything and I'm, I'm starting to learn that it's not people taking things, but I'm just voluntarily giving it away. Um, whether it be my time, my, you know, emotions, money, whatever it might be. And again, it's for me, a huge thing is frustration and decision making. If I can't make a decision, I'll just sit back and wait for somebody else to make it for me. Most people aren't going to make it in, you know, in my favor, they're going to make it in their favor. You know, I can't be mad at them for it, but it's not really any way to live my life because I'm letting other people dictate you know, what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, the caliber of my friends really haven't been all that high. So all it's, all it's going to do is it just keeps me stuck in the legal system and, and everything else, you know. Um, basically, I, I just, I kind of become a tool for people to get what they want and I take the consequences, you know, and I'm kind of tired of being everybody's scapegoat. So, I don't know, that's, it's like a real, real issue that I've really been kind of struggling with. You've also worked really hard on your view of law enforcement because you don't yeah. have the best view. Um, Mark is a, a Mark said he was is a bit hostile to law enforcement when they encounter him, and so <clears throat> that would be putting it nicely <laughs> that he's very hostile. Um, but he, we broke it down now that. You know, like certain things have to kind of be pointed out. I said, if I did these things to you and came at you that way, how would you feel? 
you know, it really has to be broken down that simply, like, because, <clears throat> pardon my language, but Mark usually is like, what do you want, you mf -er. you know, like, and, and is very aggressive at the get-go. No, even though they just want to say, hey, Mark, and that's how he responds is, you're, you're an mf -er. I don't want to f and talk to you, blah, blah, blah. And it, it just goes on and then it escalates. <clears throat> so we've really worked on not swearing at them, just answering what the question is that they're asking, because they might just be asking, hey, did you see someone walking down the street? But when you come and attack someone verbally or are that aggressive, of course, it's not going to look good for him. So Mark has, like I said, a very sour taste in his mouth, but he has worked very hard on that and not swearing and has broken it down now that he can see where his behavior dictates how they're going to treat him. And it's not necessarily they're after him. It's that he's treating them so poorly at the get go that he's dictating how this, the rest of this conversation or situation is going. So by him escalating it, they're also going to escalate it because they don't know what's happening on why he's so hostile towards them. So now, like he said, <clears throat> he had a conversation with an, you know, like, he was a, an officer and not in uniform, but he was an officer. And so he did really well. And it wasn't an aggressive tone. And I said, and how did it go? You know, and then he's like, it went really good. And there was no issue. And I'm like, because you didn't, you know, you weren't hostile. So he had no reason. And he, and he actually ended up complimenting Mark on how he's doing. But we, he had to recognize that. When, I mean, the funny thing is, is that, you know, I started getting like really anxious and I know that when I started getting anxious, that's when bad things started happening. So I just, I just stopped everything and I told, that's what I told him. I'm like, I'm just, I'm getting really anxious and I don't, I don't want to, you know, start cussing. You know, it's like, I used to have this, <laughs> I used to have this issue of calling cops, you know, MFers. I've really been working on that. And, and the cop kind of looks at me and says, yeah, I see that. I was one of those guys that you used to call that dude. <laughs> So I thought that was kind of funny, you know, to, to have run into somebody that I cussed out. And, you know, so would you say this has been a quick process, Mark? Uh, it's been like a year and a half, maybe even a little bit longer, I guess. And, and it hasn't been completely smooth, has it? Uh-uh. No? Nope. I mean, there was a... Right about the time when I was starting to to learn about my brain injury or whatever, I got into so all I could do was get in trouble and get in trouble and get in trouble. I I ended up leaving treatment um, because I was having a real is, an issue with somebody. Um, and when I when I left, I didn't I didn't have anywhere to go and homeless and and uh, the only thing I really knew how to do just to survive was you know start selling drugs again. So I'm using drugs and selling drugs and. And uh, I mean, the the police found out that I was out of treatment and they're like, oh, hell no, we're not gonna have this dude running around. You know, so they're trying to do what they're supposed to do, which is, you know, people like me not have me causing all these problems and stuff. And I saw it as, you know, they're just picking on me. You know, I, I just got out of prison, blah, 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 whatever. And I'm just, I'm just doing, I was making excuses. Like, I'm just doing this because I need to eat. I just need, I'm, well, there, I mean, there's other ways do it realistically um you know and I, I still have a problem with that we're like i know that there's a different way to do what i'm doing i don't know i don't know what it is a lot of times and when i learn what it is i'm not gonna try to figure out how to get there you know and that it's like it takes for me it takes so long to be able to recognize where i gotta go and then I, then i have to try to figure out how to get there that you know like if if jill wouldn't understand that it takes me it takes me a minute she'd be like what is this dude sitting around waiting for? Why isn't he like, he knows what, what he has to do. He's just not doing it. He doesn't want to, you know, and, it, and it's not necessarily that. Um, I mean, she doesn't let me get away with much. You know, she's, uh, she keeps me going forward, which is what I need, or, or otherwise I'll just sit around and, I don't know, feel sorry for myself, whatever. So it's kind of like a, it's almost like a delicate balance that a person has to understand that you have to give, person like me you have to give um like 
up every once in a while, but not so hard that I fall on my face. You know, because like I, I expect myself to fail. You know, that's, that's how I see myself as somebody who, like, why even try? Because I'm going to fail anyways. Well, now I know that I, I at least have the possibility of not failing. And so the second that I run into something and I fall over, I'm like, see, I told you, and screw it, I'm done, I'm done. You know, I need, I guess I need somebody to give me that encouragement because um, I don't, I don't see, I don't see myself the way other people do. So until I, until I have the ability to see myself for who I really am, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I have the support of the people that I do. Well, and I know you and Jill have had conversations about what success looks like. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, so, I mean, Jill, would you say that, you know, there, there is a change in a, a thought process of what success looks like for, for an individual with brain injury versus your other individuals you work with? Yeah, I mean, you know, like for someone else, it might be like that they have an apartment, they have a car, they have their driver's license, you know, that's their success. You know, Marx is very different. I mean, we work on what his success is. And actually, before we even work on what his success is or what he wants or considers it, we just, I asked him what his definition of a success is. Because just because you and I have a definition in our head of what we think the definition is, right, or Webster says, that doesn't mean that that's how Mark views a success. So I wanted him to tell me his definition of success then, instead of going by what the actual Webster dictionary says, right, because it's pretty hard to measure that, right? And so when he told me his version of success, which Mark, what was yours? Um. Well, actually, I got you somewhere. Um, we write a lot of stuff down. I have Mark write a lot of stuff so he can go back and look and reflect at it. So, so he has, different, like he said, he has a bunch of different notebooks, but I always have him do homework, like write it down, right? So what's your success? <clears throat> um, well, I wrote it says, to me, success is being okay in my own skin to understand that life is about growth and changes, both of which will cause pain and discomfort there are small successes throughout my life, graduate high school, get a job, new girlfriend, you know, the small stepping stones and mile markers in life. But to be truly successful, I would measure it by the relationship and connection I share with a significant other to be part of my son's and daughter's life and to be financially com comfortable, not rich, but comfortable to have a stable home life bills and uh, my bills up to date, take a vacation and actually enjoy myself or to create more positive memories than, than negative ones. So that's, that's basically what I would consider to be successful, I guess. So, you know, like, since that's a, <clears throat> a different thing instead of some like tangible, right? Like a car, like you can see that. And so then like that shows that you're successful, right? Or a watch or for some people, that's what success is, right? That shows you're successful, but these aren't tangible things. These are feelings and things like that for Mark. So it, we work on those kind of you know, like, so how, what does he need to do to get there? You know, like, cause that's where we, the struggle is. So once we know that, then we work, build off that. So a lot of the stuff that we've done and it takes, and we meet every week. I mean, Mark and I meet every week and we work on the next thing. Like what's the next step that we need to take. So we just really slow it down instead of expecting someone to be able to really see that. And it's been an eye opener for me because, you know, like I said, I used to supervise other, you know, just a regular caseload. And so you could say like, these are your goals. This is what you need to do. And it would be, it would be done. Right. Or maybe it wouldn't be, but they knew that they didn't. Whereas Mark's not trying to be defiant. He's just like, I have this idea, but I'm not sure how I get there. What's my first step, you know? So we just slow it down and break it down. And, I, and it's been, a big change for me because I don't just expect him to understand what I'm saying. And I know the expectation is now that I expect him not to understand. So I expect that I'll probably have to clarify myself two, three times before he really understands what my request is. And so that's been the difference with TBI. And, and like I said, at first I didn't, I didn't realize that. And I didn't realize that you know, until I started going to the, the class and 
to become CBIS certified that, you know, like an overdose is a brain injury, you know, I mean, not that you don't think of that, but I mean, like, I didn't think of that in a sense of brain injury, right? Like, I forget, like, yeah, you are a loss of unconsciousness, you know, but I didn't even put it to that level, you know what I mean, as far as that. So that was a huge learning curve to me, because that's a lot of our population. There's a lot of them that have had overdoses. And so, you know, it might not be the traumatic, traumatic brick to the head or whatever, but it could be an overdose and things like that. Or, and some, for some of them, it's multiple overdoses. So, you know, I mean, and a brick to the head or the fights that you have in prison, because there are a lot of fights in prison. There are a lot of big altercations that, you know, maybe even the guards don't see, you know, while, you know, which I know that happened. So, but I really had to stop and think about it because that brought things to a whole nother level and light for me as far as learning and other realization, you know, that <clears throat> there's more to it than just the physical stuff, right? It's something as, as big as like an overdose. Like I didn't even, you know, I, I don't even know why it didn't occur to me, right? But it just didn't. So it's been, it's been a huge learning curve for both of us. And we're, I mean, I'm not saying that what we're doing is right, but it's, it's helping. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? And yeah. I mean, it's, it's working. So, I mean, you may have to tailor it different to a different person, but as, as far as myself, my relationship with Jill, I mean, it's, it's working and I feel like I'm going forward. I mean, the big, the biggest thing I had to do was learn how to be more humble. You know, I have to be able to, look at myself for who I really am and not who I want myself to be, you know, the badass or whatever. And just see myself as, you know, somebody who does have a disability. So I'm still kind of struggling with that, you know, accepting it. But as long as I stay cognizant of it and I'm like, I may not accept it, but just because I don't accept it doesn't mean it's not there. So, you know, it's just, it's the, just being humble and, and knowing that, I mean, I need help. I, I'm going to be vulnerable. This is really, really hard. But prison sucks. So that's my choice is either be a little vulnerable and humble or just go back to prison, probably die in prison. I'm not trying to do that. I, I hate it. Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, Mark, how has that, then how has it impacted your non-like interaction with professional life? So like you have a job, your friends and things like that. How has this whole brain injury thing kind of impacted that? Well, like with my friends, um, I don't know, they all kind of knew I was throwing it off anyways. <laughs> but now I have a reason why, why I was like that. You know, I'm a, I'm a little, I'm eccentric by nature in the first place. but you know, like my interactions with my friends are sometimes the same that I have with the police. You know, if I don't like something or if I get frustrated, I mean, I'm just going to cuss them out. And it used to, it used to like cause a lot of friction between, you know, like my best friend and I, and I just stopped talking to him for like six months. Oh, I'm not talking to him. And then all of a sudden I'd be like, Hey, how's it going? And they're like, what the hell's wrong with you? I don't know. And now I, instead of waiting the six months to talk to a best friend or whatever, they know, Hey, I'll just go up and talk to him in like a day. He'll be over in a, in a day instead of having to wait for him to come because that's, that's my ego again. I'm, I'm like, hell no, I'm not talking to them people. And it, it's such a waste of time and, and like doing so much time in prison and all that. I mean, I, I realized the value of time is it's incredible. I mean, it's the only thing that you can never replace. And monetary things and things of that nature they come and go you know people can take them you can give them away or, or whatever but the time that you spend with another person is i mean there's you'll never be able to replace that so i don't know like i and by me having this you know realization i've been able to, to kind of spread it on to my friends to have them you know see more important things than you know drugs and, and whatever you know some of them they, they don't care they just you know give me crap about it but like my really close friends you know they support me in a lot of things instead of like you know i'm like I, well i gotta go to, to brain tree some of them give me you know give me crap about it and 
I don't, I don't want those people in my life. You know, my friends should be there to support me. And by, by doing this, it's, it started to help weed out a lot of the more negative people in my life. It's to me, it's kind of like a, I don't know, like a, a guide as to whether I should have this person in my life or not. And I'm surprised at how many I've, I've had to get rid of. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it. And as far as like work, um, I had a really good job and was a, a construction worker. They wanted me to be, to be a foreman, but I had a hard time making it to work on time. I was a great worker and I, I was, I, I just really had a hard time with that. And I would go through like periods of where I would be like depressed or I'm not, I'm not really sure, but like low, low motivation. And I mean, you can't really have that on a, on a job site. So there's not like part-time work or, you know, it's, you're either at work or you're not. I and mean, that's how construction is. And uh, so I ended up, you know, get, I, well, I went to check myself into treatment to try to get some help and I just, ne I never went back. Um, but I started working with a friend of mine. Um, she's a, the bar manager at the Avalon. So she got me a job there and explained to the general manager, you know, that I have a, a brain injury and, and, you know, mental health issues. And they've been actually very um, accommodating. Uh, you know, I call call up and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm going to be late or or what have you. And, you know, they're understanding. Like, you can't keep doing this. Like, I know I, I'm, I'm working on it. And as long as I show them, like, how I'm trying to work on these issues that I have, they're, they're okay with it. You know, if they're like, well, what are you doing to try to, you know, improve this? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Either, you, either you're going to work on something or you, we can't have you here, you know, because I could be costing them the money, but they at least have enough heart or, or whatever you want to call it to take some time and be like, you know, we're just going to go a little bit slower with this dude. Because I do, you know, when I'm, when I understand what I'm doing, I mean, I'm, I'm gone, I'm golden, you know, sometimes getting there is a real, a real struggle. So at least I have the ability to explain what's going on might not help but at least you know it makes me feel better that they're making a decision about me with more understanding than i i don't know that used to be my answer to everything i don't know so is there anything else you'd like to add that we kind of haven't touched on or anything else you think no i mean i'm just i don't know i'm, I'm kind of grateful for everything um and it's open it's opened my eyes personally like i've talked to I don't know how many of my friends are, they're just as screwed up as I am. You know, I'm like, I'm telling you, man, you got to come down and talk to these people. They're, they'll help you, you know, and they were like how I was just real skittish of, of anybody that's even close to law enforcement. You know, I'm like, well, they're not cops. They're just, you know, counselors. I don't know. I'm not going to, I got a couple of them that, you know, they're like, you know, Hey, let me go check that out because they see the changes in, in me. And, you know, they think that at first they thought, you know, I'm being shady or whatever. I'm like, no, man, I'm just, I'm just telling you, this is what I'm doing. And now people are starting to come up and start asking me like, you know, hey, how, how'd you do that? You know, how'd you get, how'd you get an apartment? How'd you, you know, get a car or, or whatever? So I'm like, yeah, come on, I'll show you. You know, and I think that's, that's what needs to be done because I didn't realize how many of my friends all had bangs to the head. You know, I mean, fighting happens all the time. I was in motocross and snowboard and all kinds of crazy stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just as much our responsibility as it is y'all's responsibility to try and help each other out, you know, that's the way I look at it. The other thing I'd like to say for Mark is that he's come a long way because for when we first started working together or when he first started, when we first really started working together for, about the brain injury, he'd be like, well, I just want to go back to the way I used to be. I just want to be normal. And he kept dwelling on like, I want to go back to like be normal and just, I just want to be normal. And it was like, he thought there was like this magic pill that he would just be able to go back to there and he'd be fixed. And he would, he, he would even say that. It's like, I just want it fixed. And, and so, and we'd always talk about like that. You don't just fix this. This isn't something that you just, you know, it's not like a broken arm where the doctor resets it and puts a cast on and then it, it heals. I said, this is something completely different and you have to make, this is your new norm, right? And so this is what you have to do. And so he's let that go and doesn't bring up like being fixed anymore. Like he's not fixed. Like he was fixated on being fixed. 
and now he's just like willing to just do the work and work on what we can do right now like what our goal is each week right and instead of being focused on like there should just be a time limit and it should just be fixed and we're done doing this now he's really recognized that there is no fixing it's something he'll have to work on for a long time forever and and he's ex he's more acceptant of that and i think that was where we really started to have a change because he was accepting of it because before it was either fix or don't fix that was it like either fix me or i'm not doing this that was <clears throat> so that's really been a big thing for mark to to do because he used <clears throat> let that go a lot and now it's just let's work on each week yep i think i think that's really uh really true with, with brain injury is that there there really often is that looking for that that magic pill you know i always feel that in my position people want me to have a magic wand that i can just make everything better um and a lot of times people are willing to accept the brain injury like if you say hey you have a history, because you know you you only touched on that very briefly mark but really it was kind of a there was a period there where you you didn't even want to kind of have say those words and you know you were kind of like no you guys are crazy i don't have a brain injury this is not you know this is not me and so it took even a bit to get to that level of acceptance of like okay yeah i have a brain injury but then part of it then you were even like okay i'm willing to accept i have a brain injury because you will have something to fix it that can make everything better like could make your criminal behavior and all that go away um, and that's probably, I would say probably the first six months I knew you, you were in that, like, I don't, I'm not even sure if I have a brain injury, uh, but I'm kind of playing along with this because okay, but not really buy in. And then for like the past year has been the coming to terms with that there's not this easy fix and it really is just you having to put in work and accept a new, you know, a new you and who you are now. It, it just takes so long. You know, I'm, I'm impulsive in the first place, and I mean, it's just like God. You know, when is this? When is this ever going to end? And you know, like the analogy Jill used, that I don't have a broken arm; I got an amputated arm. You know, I mean, you can't fix an amputated arm. You can only try to work around it and be able to keep going. Yeah. I'm stuck on. I don't have an arm. You know, what, give me a new one or whatever. You can't. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. Oh wow. Yeah. So is there anybody that has any questions that they want to ask for either Mark or Jill? You can either raise your hand or you can type them into the chat or anything. I'll start. <laughs> so you meet with Jill monthly or weekly, right? For an hour? Yeah, every, every Wednesday at oh. two o'clock. Once that's done, what's next? Like, will you go to Niam then? Like, or like what? Because this is obviously really good for you. Like, what's the what's the? Um. Next? Well, I kind of like I have a schedule, and um, I actually ended up getting uh, Corona. So, it kind of, as long as I have my my schedule set, I'm good. Once I start deviating from that, then I things start kind of falling apart. So I'm right now I'm kind of working on trying to put that schedule back together. Um, so like I have certain days where like I will call my addiction counselor on Friday, Monday and Fridays, either call or see uh, Tony and Christine up at Niam on Tuesday and Thursdays. And then Wednesdays is my day to um, talk with Jill. So I, every day I have somebody that I, I'm accountable to. Good, and, good. Um, That's kind of what I was wondering if, yeah, who your other networks were. Good. Yeah. I, I also have like peer support specialists and, you know, uh, I'm going to start going back to trauma therapy. So it, as long as it doesn't get too overwhelming, which a lot of times, you know, Jill will pick up on you. Hey, you need to slow down a little bit. You're getting overwhelmed because too much of a good thing isn't any good either. So sure. it's, just, it's just good to have people keep me between the lines. Say, good. Thank you. Yeah. 
Are there any other questions? I have a quick question. Um, you, did I hear you correctly in that you said you had uh, the COVID, that you had the coronavirus? Oh, uh, yep. How did that affect how did that affect your your outlook? Because I'm currently waiting right now to get my test results back, and I'm just curious because um, I, I find it very scary the, the fact that I might be positive for for the COVID at this point. So, how did that affect your outlook and and your ability to deal with like your brain injury and everything else in your life? Well, I mean, like I don't know. May, maybe I'm a little naive, or I don't know. But I mean, when I got it, when I when I when I first had it there's, you'll know if you got it. Um, I was like super, I had 103 temperature for like three days, and had 101 temperature for almost a month. Um, and I was like, man, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And it was um, like being stuck in my house was the hardest part. Um, like I said, I, I need to have a very rigid schedule and it, it threw that schedule away. And it was hard because I, I had a hard time breathing, um, like being able to go, like walk up, up my stairs or whatever. So to me, it was like, I'm just, I, I it made me kind of scared that I was going to lose all the headway that I, that I made because I, I would have to stop everything. I, I can't be around people. And, uh, you know, I'd have people that would stop over and bring me, you know, whatever, whatever I needed. And I know like before, you know, that would, that would have never happened. You know, people have been like, oh, yeah, Mark's sick. Yeah, we'll go find somebody else <laughs> to go and use, you know. And now it's like I was, even though I wasn't able to, like, actually work on certain things, I was still learning. And I was learning how to accept things from other people, accept help from other people. So, it, you know, it's all on how you look at it. At any situation, you're going to have negative. And that's what I always I always focused on everything was negative. And if I look at things now, well, there's also going to be a positive. Both are going to come out of any situation. I just try to find a more positive way of looking at it. And, you know, I, I mean, I firmly believe that if you have a positive outlook, even if you do have it, I mean, you're going to be all right, you know, and uh, I don't know, it's, it's all, it's all in your, it's all in your head. You know, how, how do you, how do you want to keep going, go down the path of positive or you want to go down the path or negative i mean it's all your it's all it's all my choice you know so i'm just trying to make a little bit different choice i think though mark one of the things that you touched on there is but you did in that month of having you know covid you, you were able to see the benefit of the work you've done in the year and a half of that you now have social capital. You have, you know, people in your life that care about you and are willing to support you for nothing, you know, without having that, you know, you ability to give back. And that's something that you wouldn't have had two years ago. I was, it was actually really bizarre. It was very, very strange. Like very, it was like a very foreign concept to have somebody just over and check on me or somebody just come over and, me a big thing of tang you know like who the hell does that and it, i mean that's and that's how it was in my world either you either you do it on your own or it doesn't get done you know and if you didn't have the luxury of getting so you know obviously you turn to other things or whatever and now i don't have to worry about that because even though it's really uncomfortable for me to be like okay yeah i'll, I'll take some help i mean it it sure beats having to you know, do everything on your own. It's just, it gets exhausting. And, you know, when, when a person gets exhausted, they're not making the right decisions. They're not, you know, all kinds of things. So I guess the realization of the, the benefits of being like social, socially connected, um, that was like huge. That was like a huge part of, of realizing like the importance of having good friends and good people in your life and good support group or, or what have you, you know, so. Are there any other questions? I have a question for um, Jill or anybody. So I was surprised by the amount of um, people with brain injuries that are in the criminal justice system. 
Um, so is the criminal justice system looking at those numbers and realizing that there's some people that can be impacted positively as in Mark's case? Is there anything being done? I think that's kind of why we started my position, just to see um, how much of a need there is. And so I'm kind of like a test pilot, you know, like the scene. And so we brought in like the two biggest counties in North Dakota, Burley and Cass, which we're very fortunate because we have a lot of services available to us. I, I understand, you know, not all the not all the counties or areas in the state have as many people or um, <clears throat> options as we do. So I do know that I'm very fortunate in where I work as far as, you know, having NIAM is accessible to me as they are, right? You know, things like that. But um, they are, we are working on it. Um, we're trying to get, there's a couple more people that would like to get CBIS certified. We have more people now in our department that are interested in in learning about the mental health and the, and the brain injury and stuff like that. But you know, it's hard because we also don't have the funding, right? You know, that's like the big problem for everyone because as soon as like we have this interest and we lose our funding for something, you know, like our budget, we have to cut, I think, I, I, I could be wrong on the, the percent, but I think something like 15% out of our budget this year. So, you know, like more training and more things like that aren't going to be available to us. Unfortunately, we have a really big interest in it but we just don't have the money to do all these necessary things, you know, but we are, our department sees it. And so like, that's why, you know, we're trying to like come up with something that'll work for us that, that will be a benefit to everyone and at least have the contacts, you know, or, <clears throat> you know, I have people that call me from around the state for, you know, ideas or help or, resource knowledge, things like that. So at least if there's a couple of us that know something, we can share it and spread it through our department, things like that. So, and we go to regional trainings together. Well, right now it was all virtual, but you know, I mean, so we're trying to do what we can with what we have, which is really nothing. So like, like I said, I'm pretty much just developed my program on how I wanted to take it. And I wanted to be more community involved based because I felt that was more important because if you can meet someone where they're at, you are gonna have a better success rate, you know? And if it means that I go to treatment and I meet them after or before, I'm willing to do whatever, whatever works for them, you know, because I have more success with that. And I have more people that actually wanna see me and visit me, even Mark, you know, I mean, so, I mean, it, it works. And so this, that's why my caseload's lower so that I can put the time and effort into it. Like, that's why Mark and I have every Wednesday, two o'clock. We do, we used to always meet in person. Even when he had COVID, we met on Zoom or on the phone. So it didn't stop, you know? I mean, so it's just a matter of <clears throat> just trying to get out there and then trying to sh help share that knowledge with the people that I work with in the state. So, and I would say that for us, I mean, that's one of the pieces, you know, that we're trying to do as far as, I mean, like, this webinar and us going to James River and then going down and presenting at Cass County and, you know, the partnership that, you know, we have with Colorado. So, you know, Colorado has done all of this work and fortunately we saw that they'd done that and I was kind of like, wow, that's cool. Can we borrow that and steal that from you? And they said, sure. So I was like, okay, great. Um, so trying to have those resources and work on that education because, you know, and part of even wanting, you know, to have Mark and Jill speak today, I mean, Mark's an example of, you know, he still is on, you know, probation, um, and it's an, it's an up and down. He still, you know, needs to have that, you know, that time with Jill every week and he goes to NIAM, which, um, you know, and sees uh, providers there and is in his addiction counselor and, you know, those pieces. But the change that coming to terms with the brain injury has had on him and has that opportunity of kind of working on breaking the cycle that he's had. And so the more that we can share that and get that information out to um, others, the better. Um, I will say, you know, North Dakota, part of this has also been, North Dakota has been doing quite a bit of 
uh, criminal justice behavioral redesign. Um, so North Dakota does have the program called Free Through Recovery right now, which is kind of a specialized care coordination uh, programming for individuals with an identified behavioral health condition that are um, on parole or probation. Um, and they do include brain injury in that as far as one of those qualifying conditions. Um, and then just last session, um, the state passed a 1915I Medicaid state plan amendment um, that will be also providing care coordination um, and uh, peer support and some, a bunch of other services. And the brain injury was included in that as well. So part of our thing in doing more training and these pieces is being able to get the resources for those providers to help them. You know, it's not enough to just identify. Um, and that was one of the things that was really strong to me when I looked at all these states that had identified, you know, the percent in the prison population and that piece, I'm like, okay, but if you're just identifying and then not providing resources or not providing the support follow-up, then that really doesn't, doesn't do any, any good as far as breaking that cycle. You know, Mark wouldn't be where he's at now if as providers we had just identified him as an individual with brain injury a year and a half ago and then walked away. You know, he's needed that, you know, the, the increase in education and the support of having Jill who's, you know, taking it upon to attend training. So that whole system to really come to terms with the brain injury. So I think the more that we can get out that education and that information for providers to support them, the better. Okay, anybody else have a last quick question? Um, not, we will, I wanna definitely thank uh, Jill and Mark um, for sharing today, uh, particularly Mark for I know that this is basically opening up your whole like personal life to uh, uh, strangers and whatnot, but your willingness to do that is wonderful. I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you, Jill, for taking your time for your busy schedule. We appreciate it. Thank you. So, Thank you. Guys. <clears throat> so, it's great, great to hear the sessions and how much of a we call progress you've done on the TBI with the with the correctional system, Rebecca. Because that was what that was one of my big problems or issues. <laughs> the, the correction systems didn't have knowledge about. TBI for their inmates. Yeah. I, I think people would be amazed if they if they were able to bridge the gap between people like me and people like Jill or police. Like that just that distance between the two is I mean it's like a huge wall. Once once we were able to get over that, then it's been you know I don't want to say it's been easy, but it's been a much smoother, smoother transition, you know, but trying to get, you know, all the people that are in prison or jail or whatever to be okay with their probation officer it might, might take a minute, but it's definitely going to be worth it if you can, for sure. Sounds good. It would be, uh, I don't know what Jill or you guys thought, I know Rebecca has heard this before. It would be nice if we could get the, what do you call it, college system not college system, but your education training you need to have the TBI knowledge yep. education to part of your, what are your training you need to be a parole officer and correction officers. That should be, TBI training should be in that curriculum. Yeah. Be I also think that like in prison, they give you like a lot of classes and courses you have to take. And like for um, drug addicts and alcoholics, we have to take um, uh, like uh, treatment, like drug and alcohol, I think that they should have TBI included in that. I mean, there's like 80 some percent of, of us have TBI. Well, you're either going to understand what you have or you're going to be able to help somebody who does. Like, I, I mean, I just think that, they should, that it should be mandatory, you know, a, a mandatory class or, or part of a treatment in, in prison, personally. And right now, like um, a lot of the <clears throat> police departments around the state have been taking a different look at mental health. So they've actually um, put uh, like CIT training 
as part of their curriculum to be hired or as, or as part of their training program um, or ma making it mandatory for them at some point, maybe not in their FTO phase, but <clears throat> in part of their in part of their curriculum that they have to take that um, be just because it's so much more knowledgeable and and I like I went through it. I said it's the hardest training I've been to, but it was like the best training I've been to because it's it's so real real world based. You know, like you have actors that are you know like they they take what your job is and then they break it down to like the scenario that you're dealing with you know, to make it real life situation instead of like, you know, you have these people that don't really know what your job is and then like trying to make it realistic for you, which these people really did a really good job. And it was, you know, between being like schizophrenic or if you have autism or if you had a TBI, things like that. So it's really good training. It's just hard because it's, you know, you have all these peers judging you and critiquing you because of the They'll take timeouts. I'm, I'm sure many of you have done it or something, but they take timeouts, you know, critique you and give you feedback, whether it be good or bad, you know, but I mean, so our, the departments are starting to recognize that it's a huge issue. And so, I mean, we're lucky in North Dakota that they're putting their officers through this because it's a five day pro five day program and it's eight hours a day, 40 hours, you know, and it's tough. Like in, you know, and it really breaks it down for you and puts it in a different perspective. You know, easy to say, right? It's, you know, armchair quarterback to be a cop, you know, and, and what you would do in that situation. Well, it's the same thing to be, you know, if you're schizophrenic and you have something like this and how you deal with it, or if you have autism and things like that. So it's been good. And it's unfortunate that we don't have the classes all the time for everyone, but I've told everyone that works in our department too, that if they ever have the opportunity to do it, even though it is a really hard class, but it's probably one of the best trainings I have just because the perspective it gives you. So, well, thank you everybody. We appreciate it. And thank you again, Mark and Jill for sharing. And we, uh, you know, check us out or reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions or need any other information or resources, okay? Take care. Yeah.